We are so blessed and so happy to have Ajahn Brahmali here with us for our regular Clear Mountain interviews. And I'll just read a quick biography of Ajahn Brahmali. So Ajahn Brahmali was born in Norway in 1964. He first became interested in Buddhism and meditation in his early 20s after a visit to Japan. Having completed degrees in engineering and finance, he began his monastic training as an Anagarika, keeping the eight precepts in England at Amaravati and Chithurst Buddhist monasteries. After hearing the teachings from Ajahn Brahm, he decided to travel to Australia to train at Bodhinyana Monastery. Ajahn Brahmali has lived at Bodhinyana Monastery since 1994 and was ordained as a bhikkhu with Ajahn Brahm as his preceptor in 1996. Ajahn Brahmali Mahatera has now been in robes for 26 years. I think that math is correct. Hopefully. It is correct, yeah. <laughs> okay. Ajahn Brahmali's knowledge of the Pali language and of the suttas is excellent. A regular contributor to Discourse.Sutta Central, he has also published two essays on dependent origination and a book called The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Text, which is a really great book uh, with the Buddhist Publication Society in collaboration with Bhante Sujato. So yeah, thank you so much, Bhante. Um, so one thing which people might know you from uh, is your, um, your excellent work with the early Buddhist texts, this concept of EBT, early Buddhist texts. Would you be willing to give an outline of what that means for people who maybe aren't familiar with the term? Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, as I mentioned before, is one of the kind of areas that really interests me and I think is actually extraordinarily important actually for a proper understanding of what Buddhism is about. It really matters enormously. And the, the basic idea is to try to uh, kind of come back to an idea of what, was, what did actually the Buddha himself teach? Can we say anything about uh, you know wh what is the origin of these uh, of this whole thing we call Buddhism, which is a massive historical movement, uh, and it's moved into the world in various ways. You know, gone from country to country, and has been influenced by cultures around the world. Uh, gone to China and become Chan Buddhism. Gone to Japan and become Zen. Uh, and it goes. It kind of alters a little bit. It changes. The doctrine changes a little bit. The core ideas of Buddhism are transformed because of the cultural conditioning that comes with moving into a new culture. So for that reason, it's actually very interesting to ask, well, where does all this originate from? Where does it actually come from? And, um, and, and sometimes, just to start out, sometimes people think that it doesn't matter so much yeah, where it comes from. Buddhism is Buddhism, and, and there's just different ways of looking at the, uh, you know, the Buddhist teachings, and it doesn't actually matter what is original and what is not. And I, I hear this view a lot around the world, and I think it is profoundly mistaken. I mean, very, very seriously mistaken. And the reason for that is because Buddhism is about a particular insight into reality. And that insight is an understanding really of non-self. And either you have that insight, yeah, you have it fully and completely, or you haven't. And that distinction is like almost like an unbridgeable gap. It's like a chasm between the two, like a precipice. And you either you are standing on top of the mountain you have kind of climbed up the mountain and you are free of the you know of it, or you are standing on the other side a bit further down and you're trying to kind of reach the top and you and there's an unbridgeable gap between these two things and so that um, because and this is how it is basically talked about in the suttas yeah stream entry is this kind of big bang where you kind of that you never forget in the rest of your life as it says in the suttas you always remember where that happened and um uh, because of that, uh, uh, it actually matters enormously whether you have that insight or you haven't. Uh, uh, one side, the ones who have the insight will understand what the Buddhist teaching is about. Uh, the other side will have some idea, but they will also have a certain degree of wrong view because they haven't actually seen the teachings fully yet. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and so the question of who has this insight and who hasn't actually, for that reason, matters enormously. And only those people who have that full insight uh, will be able to teach Buddhism fully and completely. The other ones will very likely to make mistakes because they haven't got the full right view right yet. And so then we have to ask, well, who are the people who have this insight? 
And that question is very difficult to answer with any certainty. You look around the world, there's lots of very inspiring monastics, monks and nuns, and there are some very inspiring lay people around as well. You can find that in all the various Buddhist cultures. But it's very hard to be certain that they have that full insight. They may have it partially, they may have been gone a long way on the path. And there's only one person that we have to say with certainty as Buddhists had that insight, and that is the Buddha. Because if the Buddha didn't have the insight, well, then the whole thing collapses. Uh, there is nothing really there. We know that the entire history of Buddhism, uh, all the cultural evolution that had all the scriptures that have been developed, you know, over uh, the last two and a half thousand years, they are founded. Uh, they take the Buddhist suttas as their um, uh, foundation. You know, this is actually what everything else is built on. And if the Buddha got it wrong, well, everything else collapses. Everything else is meaningless. It only has meaning insofar as the words of the Buddha have any meaning here. So we have to assume that the only person we can assume with, uh, that we have to assume was had an insight into these things uh, is the Buddha himself. And for that reason, the word of the Buddha matters enormously, yeah, because everyone else is gonna be a degree of uncertainty, but with the Buddha, we have to have that assumption. Uh, so then the, um, the next question then uh, arises, and that question is, well, uh, can we know with any certainty what the Buddha said? And the answer, I think, is yes. And the reason we can say that is because there are certain teachings in Buddhism that are universal. Yeah, you find them in all the various strands of Buddhism. You find them in Tibetan Buddhism. You find it in Mahayana Buddhism. You find it in the various schools of Theravada. You find it in the, you know everywhere. And these teachings that are fundamental to these uh, Buddhist, uh, that are found everywhere in the Buddhist world, uh, well, these are the things that we can say with a high degree of certainty are the word of the Buddha. So what is that? Uh, and what that is, and it, this is a, a very interesting, uh, you know, area of study. And I think this area of study it started with a, an Englishman, uh, an Englishman who was a scholar of Chinese, his name was Samuel Beale, and he lived back in the 1870s or something like that. Uh, Samuel Beale, he was reading the uh, uh, Chinese, some of the ancient Chinese suttas, and also some of the Vinaya in the ancient Chinese. Uh, and then he saw, you know, he also knew some Pali or had some access to Pali or whatever. Uh, and then he realized that, lo and behold, that these rules <laughs> in Chinese are exactly the same things that we have in Pali. Uh, and this is kind of, this was for him astonishing yeah? because the Chinese culture and the Pali culture are uh, divided by massive barriers of culture, of language, of, of, of distance, of time, of all of these kind of things. Yeah. And despite those enormous, that enormous distancing, yeah, here was something that they had in common. Yeah? And then he made the prediction and the prediction that he made back in the 1870s or something like that was that, well, I, his guess was that all of those scriptures, the suttas that you find in uh, uh, in Pali language, uh, very likely were also find in Chinese. Yeah? And of course, he turned out to be right. That was a very interesting prediction that he made. It turned out to be correct. Uh, and uh, so what you find then is that uh, uh, the are in common with Chinese Buddhism, or the Chinese, you know, Chinese, the whole history of Chinese Buddhism, and what is in common with the Pali Buddhism is precisely a core, um, uh, you know, core suttas, basically the four Nikayas, the long discourse, the middle length discourses, the connected discourses, the numerical discourses, and of course, a large part of the Vinaya Pitaka. This is what is in common between these two vastly different cultures. And then as time has gone by, as we have studied these things more, we have realized this is not just the case between Buddhism and is also basically the same kind of suttas, except that they are is much more lacking uh, in the uh, Tibetan uh, scriptures. Uh, there are Sanskrit teachings. There are uh, uh, Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. Uh, teachings. There are various Prakrits, which are the early, you know, the various kind of local languages in India. And again and again, we find the same thing. What is in common between all of these things uh, are what is equivalent uh, to the four Nikayas, basically, in the Pali language. A little bit more than that, but that's essentially what it comes down to. Uh, and so what 
this means is that um, anything apart from that is, uh, you know, is maybe correct. We don't really know. It's very hard to say. It has very powerful and important consequences for how we look at the Pali Suttas, uh, how we consider the entire Theravada tradition. Very often it is said that, you know, it, when, when I say these kind of things, probably some of the people think I'm some sort of Theravada fundamentalist. Yeah, Theravada is the best. Yeah, everything else is bad. <laughs> But, but that is not really the point. The point is not that at all. In fact, Theravada itself has also been, has evolved and has changed over time. And many things in Theravada are not really commensurate or, you know, with the suttas. And they turn out, sometimes they can actually be corrupted. So in Theravada Buddhism, we have exactly the same problem as they have in Mahayana Buddhism, that there is a core sutta as the early teaching and then there is a development that's happened over time long period after that and um, so we too can actually benefit enormously from this kind of distinction between the earliest teachings uh, which are clearly in common between all the various schools and all the various traditions uh, and later addition which includes the abhidhamma yeah the thing which is often said to be the highest expression of the buddhist teachings uh, turns out to be Maybe not, probably not the Buddhist teachings at all. Yeah, and that's kind of an eye opener. Or, of course, things like the Visuddhi Manga, which is considered the, by many, the kind of greatest meditation manual. Yeah, <laughs> in the Buddhist world. Or, of course, everything else that has been, uh, uh, you know, um, come down to us after long time after the Buddha. All of that is, it may not be wrong, yeah, but it is dangerous to rely on those things. Uh, and especially dangerous to take those and give those precedent precedence over the suit that, that is especially dangerous. So anyway, I better stop there, but I there's, <laughs> there's probably more to be said. But, uh, yeah.